good afternoon one and all i hope my voice is audible to all of you rinse it am i audible yes sir we can hear you thank you thank you so much good of honor and pleasure to be the moderator for this session and your host as has been the tradition that uh, dot talks webinar series have been following today also we are going to discuss about a very exciting very important topic titled orality memories from an onomastic perspective and uh, we are really happy to have with us dr temjan wavan who is currently the head of the college timapur he has done extensive research in colonial and post colonial naga historiography as well as the perception on and representation of the early nagas indeed a very learned person but before i request sir i just want to share a poem that came in my mind and uh, maybe uh, that poem is about the memory and that was written by uh, belly however i would not read out the poem but just i want to let you understand that memories have its own life and what we can take away from the memories help us to understand you know the world around us so today we are going to talk about the memories and that too uh, from the oral traditions so i request uh, dr uh, temjan wapam to kindly uh, kindly uh, take over the stage and please uh, share your knowledge with us because from my from my point of view personally this subject is totally new the onomastic perspective for uh, this is a, this is a word you know which caught my attention you know when sir has uh, shared his views with me that he is willing to speak on this particular topic and i was like oh my god what this onomastic perspective is all about so this is what we are going to discuss today thank you so much dr temjan wapang please take your time <clears throat> okay uh, thank you anirudha for the introduction i just wanted to show my face for a few seconds to let you know that you know this is me <laughs> okay yeah and uh, yeah as a tradition i i would like to take this honor to thank that's uh, college the organizers of dot talks to have me here and then uh, share this work in progress this is a humble work in progress i, I should say that and i'll be really really glad to have questions from your end so that uh, i can improve on it now before i begin sharing my screen uh, greetings from uh, unity college on behalf of unity college to everyone thank you so much for joining this uh, short talk so i will begin my presentation and to save data i'll be uh, just closing off my video for a while uh can you see my uh screen yes sir yes. Can uh, thank you thank you so much okay um the topic is orality memories from an automatic perspective and this is a work like i say this is a work in progress and actually this is a reworked version of a paper joint paper that was uh, presented in an international seminar uh the title was onomastics and memory revitalizing naga orality it was uh, presented in july 2020 uh, it was a joint presentation along with uh, this uh, dr lanukumla launcher she is the head of the department don bosco college kohima and uh, she is also the coordinator of this uh, research cell uh, now when we talk about onomastics like uh, 
Professor Aniruta was uh, saying, the curiosity, it's very simple, just the term is a bit complicated, otherwise the meaning is very simple for, I'm very sure many uh, of you will know what is onomastics, but then for students here, I would like to enlighten that it is a study of the history and the origin of proper names. So we all have names, we have you know places that have names, and based on that, we have these uh, subfields of onomastics, that is anthroponomy and toponomy. Now, toponomy deals with the study of the origin of proper names of places. Like for instance, I come from a village, means I belong to a village, particular village. So my village name is Learman. In our Learman, Lear means uh, it's gooseberry. So it seems the first place to be cleared when uh, our forefathers started off the village happened under the uh, this gooseberry tree, and that is how the name start. Uh, coming to anthroponomy, we have like, you know, uh, the definition is obviously studies, okay, that it studies the names associated with individuals, the parental or the last names and nicknames. Just to give you a perspective, for instance, uh, I think it was in March uh, this year, to, uh, around March 27th, if I'm not mistaken, Twins were born in Chhattisgarh to, uh, uh, to a couple. And then these twins, uh, the boy was named as COVID, okay? And the girl was named as Corona. It happened in uh, Raipur, Chhattisgarh. Yeah, so it seems the parents were justifying saying that uh, they were facing several difficulties during the lockdown and therefore they decided that to you know, to name this, their kids as Corona and COVID to make this day memorable. Now that brings in memory. In many cases, uh, some names are specific, okay, to villages or clans, and sometimes renaming also happens due to some e that might be related with like good, bad, or significant events associated with the person, the family, the clan, or even the village. So uh, if we go more into uh, how names were considered here, especially in the Naga context, some names are also associated with uh, like cases of inclusion or exclusion, uh, right? <clears throat> so the question is what kind of choices are available to each case? Okay, what kinds of role do names play in this social life? This brings us to uh, anthroponomy as an approach and a tool. Because I, uh, since it falls within onomastics, I decided that names will be an interesting topic to take up. So I am narrowing it down to anthroponomy. Um, all that for a society without an indigenous script uh, like the Nagas, orality is usually the primary medium uh, for the preservation and transmission of knowledge. And it also, uh, I think, relates to belief systems, uh, practices, okay? And that was passed down from generation to generation. Uh, while the Nagas were being written about when they did not know how to write also, while they were being written about during the colonial period also, this oral tradition still continued to be the integral uh, tradition of the Nagas. And I think means it is also relevant even to this day in many parts of Naga society. The transliteration of most of the Nagas uh, oral tradition was done by these uh, colonial writers like you know officials as well as Christian missionaries. And despite the fact that these, most of these uh, records were uh, usually laymen in character, okay, because most of them were laymen to history or ethnography, they were done with the best objective vigor. And for that reason, Naga history owes its survival uh, to these records left by the colonial writers. Now, although many stories are recounted and you know, transliterated at some point of time, I, I should say that even to this day, okay, uh, most of these stories just form parts of souvenirs and commemorative books of various communities. 
and it never became a part of mainstream Naga history. Honestly, I should say this is one area where Naga historical research uh, should focus on, especially when it comes to oral, uh, uh, going for oral uh, studies, studies on orality. Uh, this bulk of scholarships that engage with the Naga past, okay, they have drawn a lot of inspiration from uh, colonial transliterations, right, of the Naga oral tradition. It ranges from songs, odes, myths, legends, and uh, however, most of these colonial and post-colonial works, they reflect only uh, faint traces of onomastic approach because uh, they were more towards the study of the culture, the practices and all, right? So I, I, I believe that this study will definitely help us in reconstructing events, reconstructing timelines, or at least approximates. That's what I believe. And uh, again, one more fact is that anthroponomy as a concept, okay, it exists in every society. The, like I said earlier, only the term is complex, otherwise it is there with us. And for instance, like uh, when we meet, when we usually meet people, we ask their names, and then uh, sometimes he might just reply saying that is a very beautiful name. What does it mean? Right. And this will actually bring back memories. However, this was not done. We did not go beyond asking the meaning of the name. And then that is where uh, things stop. So anthroponomy at a glance, when I look from a world perspective and uh, from a micro Naga perspective, I should say that in, in any parts of the world, in many parts of this world, we have set orthographic rules. Now, orthography is the art of writing words with uh, proper letters, okay? And then uh, when a letter is changed, any variation in letter happens, then there are changes in meanings. I'll just give you one example, means uh, examples of maybe a few uh, scholars who have done these onomastic studies in the Middle East, like uh, Ran Zadok or uh, Luca Repansek, they were looking into names that were occurring in Middle Eastern names. And interestingly, Joshua, the biblical name, Joshua, they were trying to identify the names where, it, where this name actually originated. And then they were also trying to study whether the name Jobab, okay, Jobab is also another biblical name, existed before the second century BC. And this study of names were very, very critical on these orthographic rules because if they come across maybe uh, inscriptions that have similar sounding names, but then the letters are different, then the whole uh, meaning of that particular word changes. However, in the Naga case, it is not like that. That is what I have found so far. Okay, uh, it may deviate from the all already existing or established uh, onomat onomastic studies elsewhere across the globe. Why is this so? Because Nagas, by virtue of being uh, people without generic script, indigenous script, uh, we did not have any alphabetical limitations to the names, right? And then all these actually the names that we are using actually are inherited from our colonial uh, writers and observers and uh, later on uh, the first literary elites of the Nagas also. So let us have a look at uh, our Naga lexicography. That is uh, one study that uh, I want to focus on uh, because before I come to the uh, my argument, I just want to give you this, uh, clear this uh, whole uh, ground okay for my uh, argument so we have we can see that there are two uh, dictionaries here one was written in 1893 by Clark and another is uh, you know edited version by Ausenden okay and it was uh, released in 2019 uh, there are variations in diacritical marks and that means the accents However, the meanings do not usually change. So I'll just show you these variations in diacritical marks. Uh, see, for instance, we have this year, 
according to the hours here and uh, the upper one is uh, clark's own english naga english manuscript okay dictionary you will see that the year is kum k v m okay with a dot below right and um, uh, buffalo i i am taking the case of buffalo here okay buffalo was spelled as zang z but then uh, when we pronounce it it was chan and here in the aroposa down here you will see that uh, year is now kum okay with uh, two dots above right and then uh, buffalo has now the letter j instead of z uh, what i'm trying to say here is that while the names in other societies which had written scripts okay the 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 meaning of these names changes based on the mere presence or absence of a particular letter okay the absence of this orthographic rule in case of the Nagas did not hamper the meaning of the names. And uh, this is one instance that I'll be narrating now. Um, I think I'll have to read out a uh, story here. I, I want to read a story, share a story here. So uh, the story goes like this. Uh, this is, by the way, a narrative given by Kirim Liba. Uh, he is the former village uh, council chairman and a citizen of German village, uh, Japukung Range. Okay, this is under Mangulamba uh, within Mugukchung district. His name was passed down his family as a memory of an event that happened more than four generations ago. Uh, according to uh, Kirim Liba, his name, his name is an uh, honorific name that we call it as Narokom in our, okay of uh, Kim Liba. Now, Kim, according to uh, the dictionary, is it's no more there, but then according to our villagers, uh, Kim means Alar. Now, Alar is a term used uh, for to denote a slave. And then Liba, not so significant, but then it is derived from the word Ali or Bai. So there is, you know, I'm just giving you a clue of uh, story that i'm about to narrate now now here i will just narrate one story uh, keep on narrating the story okay uh, just to give you a perspective of the timeline the event happened during the generation of samajiba please keep in mind kirim liba down here is uh, you know the present day uh, person he is still alive okay and samajiba is like uh, his uh, forefather and i am just doing it from ascending order of course i'll bring it to an ascending order later on okay uh, the narrator kim liba's father was temjen kaba right whose father was yungbung lamba and his father was imti nangbong and whose father was again yungbung meren and finally uh, his father was samachiba again uh, he, the narrator has he, he is not very sure but then he is saying that there are about five more generations preceding samajiba which uh, he did not mention and before i go into deep into the story again i just want to give you a perspective of the time and space involved here this is lerman village and it is nearby uh Assam border uh, precisely towards um Mariani. Now, if I give you another map, then it will make sense. This is like Learman that is uh, pinned with a red one. And then there is another story, uh, another uh, place called Longchang down here where the uh, blue dot ends. So Learman happened to be the, you know, uh, conduit or the place, uh, the junction where trade between the plains of Assam and the villages near and far uh, happened not at Learman, but you know it, the trade route passed by Learman, and people from other villages used to pass by this Learman village to trade their crafts and then maybe buy or exchange essential items like uh, salt, dry fish. Okay, from the plain of Assam, uh, it so happened that one fine day, a group of people from Longjiang village 
that is uh, located around uh, 100 something kilometers, okay, as per our present day calculation, was passing by Learman after, you know, their trading was completed in the plains. A fellow traveler of this Long Jiang group, they, uh, he has suddenly become very sick and then they could not proceed further because this person was sick and therefore the group requested shelter care okay and care for their uh, companion from the villagers of german because they had uh, stopped nearby and the villagers of Lerman also like uh, took this as a part of uh, as their pride to actually host this sick person okay and therefore the group from longjiang they kept their companion under the care of uh, Lerman village and then they proceeded towards their village. Uh, however, unfortunately, after this group left for Long Chang, the person who was sick, he passed away. And it seems uh, when this person passed away and uh, you know, uh, villagers from Lierman were not very sure when this, uh, their other party from Long Chang will come uh, to take their companion, they decided that instead of letting the body rot, okay, they will actually uh, perform a uh, very honorable uh, funeral, okay, and then that during that time, the funeral was, it was not burial, by the way, it was, uh, you know, the body was kept on a platform where, where you know, the body was let to rot or sometimes uh, if you burn fire, then it will dry up. That is uh, that was a practice which was happening during that time. And when these people from Longchang arrived to take their companion back to their village, the it was found out that you know the people from Lierman has already uh, means uh, taken care of the funerary rites. However, when they heard that this person who was dead. Uh, was not accorded a decent funeral. Now I'll tell you what happened. It seems at Learman there was a particular place where these dead bodies were kept at platforms. For anyone who died uh, in the village, the body was kept at a particular place. However, this person who from Longchang who died was not kept there, but then his body was kept a bit far away from that location. And that is something which the Longchang villagers felt as an insult, okay? And they, they were so enraged, in fact, they were so enraged and therefore they demanded that this issue will be resolved only if the people of Lerman uh, compensated them with uh, Akang. Now, Akang is a term that is used uh, for fine, okay? And the value was 30 buffaloes and a specific number of bells. We call it as Changdong. Okay, by the way, uh, this, uh, what we call bells were very, very expensive during that time. They considered it as a you know, form of currency also. And then along with this buffalo and the number of bells, they should be accompanied by a, a you know, slave. Alar, we call it as Alar. So failing which, the people from Longchang would attack Lierman. So that was the ultimatum given to uh, the people of uh, citizens of Lierman. And in order to avoid a conflict, or in fact, a general massacre, because uh, Lierman uh, is still a small village, by the way, um, the villagers of Lierman undertook an uh, emergency revenue collection we even to the uh, that even to this day okay we do a collection like our uh, village union will collect some you know emergency fund so that fund is known as putishi we still use that word putishi so that was an emergency revenue collection that we always do so that maybe in times of need for the villagers we can use that uh, you know fund collected from that uh, revenue so each household was supposed to contribute a share of what, right? Uh, and the combined collection should be worth the value of the fine demanded by Long Zhang. So
So the villagers were able to collect uh, the required number of the buffaloes and the bells, but there was one big problem. Nobody was willing to go to Longchang as a slave, volunteer, okay. And those people who had uh, slaves also, they were unwilling to part with their slaves. However, there was one person, Samaji, and he had two slaves at his uh, possession. And it seems he sent one slave to Longjiang accompanying the buffalo and the bells. And with this, a possible bloodshed was averted. Now, this event, many of the villagers have forgotten and even us also, even me also, when I started to uh, you know, uh, listen to this story, it was interesting because uh, even my grandfather did not narrate this story to me. But then the family of Kirimliba and, you know, means Samachiba and the succeeding generations, they did not forget this. It was during this uh, father's time that they decided that Samachiba's contribution should be commemorated by bringing back uh, as this event, memory of this event to uh, honorific name and that is how this name came about. So in a way, uh, Kim Liba is, if we look from a meaning, uh, extended meaning, the slave has bought back the honor of the village or saved the village. That is how it can be translated, loosely translated. Um, the story uh, narrated by this uncle Kim, Okay, it brings back to life a period uh, preceding the pre-Christian era also of, of the Nagas, and then even uh, it touches those uh, time when uh, Christianity was about to uh, actually set its foot in our village. Uh, to continue with Kirim's narration, I, I just want to like show you here that uh, it was, during Samachipa's period, when headhunting was somehow there, it was not so prevalent. That is what was said by the narrator. And slavery uh, was also practiced. Now, before I move on to uh, the you know, genealogy again, I just want to you know, uh, share something, a peculiar way in which uh, Samachipa came to own these slaves. Okay. It seems when villagers uh, usually collected putisi or the revenue collection was done, uh, sometimes some families were not so not in a position to you know part uh, maybe uh, with or they were not able to contribute also. And when this was uh, this happened, then uh, usually rich people used to or rich relatives used to. Uh, you know, pay on their behalf. So maybe there were some families who were not able to repay, I mean, pay this uh, putisi, and then Samajiba used to help them from time to time. But then now that the debt has mounted, and then these people are unable to pay back, repay Samajiba for what the, he has invested, it was very obvious that uh, they had to part with their children. That is a practice which was prevalent in our village. So Samachiba came to own uh, these two slaves whose fate was now at his discretion, okay? Uh, and the parents did not have any claim hands -off. Moving up, you will see that Samachiba's son, Yongung Meren, uh, his time witnessed the coming of Clark's evangelist, Zilibabu, okay? It gives us an uh, idea of how swiftly things are developing in this small corner in Nagaland, right? And secondly, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Zili Babu is also the first pastor of Mulungim Sin, uh, which was a new village created uh, after Mulungkimo. They parted ways from uh, Mulungkimo. So given this indication of Zili Babu's entry into Lirman, we can have an approximate estimate because Zili Babu's record was there. 
it seems he entered uh, Lierman in 1885. That was clearly mentioned, and therefore uh, he his timeline was. Uh, I I should say that his timeline is enabling us to establish a, a approximate uh, time frame of when this thing was happening. So, uh, Yong Wong Maran's time, this effort to evangelize uh, Learman happened, and then finally, after 13 years, Imti Nangbong became one of the first Learman villagers to be baptized in 1898, and uh, later on, you will, uh, of course, not so significant, but then the question is, how then has a name enriched memory? So that is uh, one thing that we need to ponder upon. Uh, names are not mere functions of uh, you know, nomenclature. That's what I want to say here. See, if you look into you know, uh, the diagram that I have, I hope it doesn't confuse you also, but then I hope it makes sense to you. We are talking about uh, Dearman. OK, of course, Vaya, please uh, ignore that. It should be there, trade with Asam by Learman. Right. Uh, we are talking about a memory which has many things intertwined. We have even between Longchang village and Learman village, we have an uh, idea about trade with Assam. Uh, you know, it's not only the Learman doing the trade, but then uh, people from other parts of uh, our uh, country doing this. Uh, trade with Assam to Learman by a Learman. Then we also have, you know, the approximate uh, distance, the space that we are talking about, Longchang, which is about 100 kilometers away from uh, Learman. So just with the mention of a name, Kim Liba, we were able to come up with an analysis on this. Now, uh, like I said earlier, names are not mere functions of nomenclature because the names of the peoples uh, are products of a system, I should say, a system of uh, a value system that reflects way of life of a given culture. Uh, it is very true, okay, that many Naga names may appear, uh, means appear uh, to sound very similar and very common because we know them routinely, but then it, like I said earlier again, uh, you know, the name, asking the name, the meaning of the name, it stops there, okay? There is no effort to actually interpret uh, them. Therefore, for a historian, I think it, it becomes a very important, you know, source of inquiry, this onomastic study. I, uh, we are trying to demonstrate that possibility of not only retracing a past and retrieving memories and events, okay, are happening, but there is a possibility to extract information of practices and traditions, right? Since uh, most of the meanings cannot be found uh, in the mind of the listener or maybe the, you know, even the speaker, because sometimes memories just vanish, okay? There is a need to extensively study uh, take up this onomastic uh, exercise so that we don't lose uh, part of history that is uh, intertwined with the names associated with those events, right? And although this is happening, yeah, this is like accepted that uh, many Nagas, Naga communities have been commemorating uh, events in their best way possible. I have mentioned that earlier also, like through souvenirs and other forms of literature. I think uh, it is uh, perhaps the right time. I, uh, it is perhaps the time, okay, to bring this onomastic tradition to mainstream academics. As we can see from this anthroponomic study, uh, information I we got from uh, the story itself talks about genealogy, firstly, then mobility because of the fact that uh, you know people usually people are moving from one place to another uh, through trading okay mostly through trading then we also have a belief system now talking about belief system i think i forgot to mention that you know there is a funny story associated with uh, the way in which uh, the baptism happened earlier 
like I, I'll just go back. Timothy Nongbo, he was the one of the first to be baptized in Learman. So it seems our forefathers, they were enemies. And then uh, when there was a agenda, a proposal to baptize these few converts, uh, leaders had a meeting. And then uh, in that meeting, we discussed that if somebody was put into the water and then, you know, his soul will be taken away. Okay, and therefore, from each clan, only one one person was sent uh, to for this baptism. That was, uh, you know, a story that was narrated by uh, again Uncle Kiram. Now, again, if we look from another perspective, we will see that uh, we have tried to correlate and study also and validate uh, the entries of Clark's dictionary where the term slave is mentioned as alar. That means around 1880s uh, also, uh, it is an accepted fact that there was slavery that was happening in the Ao region. And uh, finally, we have like, uh, you know, uh, evidences of interactions with other communities, which uh, I should say that is also somehow related with mobility that uh, I have mentioned earlier. Now, just one request to everyone. This is a work in progress. And then I should say that uh, this is not a new perspective. It is there. Uh, it is so common that we have actually, uh, you know, ignored this, okay? Sometimes it becomes so common that we usually tend to ignore it. And therefore, uh, this is not, not a new study, but then what we are trying to do is we want to attempt a re-study of, you know, uh, oral traditions through this onomastic. With this, I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for your enlightenment. Yes, I got all my answers because this terminology has been really new to me. I learn a lot. Or maybe, you know, I request you to recommend some books also for us, okay, to know more about this approach. Anyway, thank you so much, sir. Now I open this uh, platform for questions. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, whatever is there in your mind, whatever questions are there, please go ahead, shoot, send me answer. Thank you. Okay, uh, my co-presenter, uh, Dr. Lanu Kamla, Akamla Longchar, uh, she is here, and I'm very sure uh, I'll be really glad if uh, she can also chip in uh, when questions, if there are any questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Akam, in advance. Oh, that's that's really wonderful. Wonderful, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I want to ask this question. Uh, it would be purely from a uh, methodological perspective, from research uh, and analytical perspective. That is, what would be the limitations to this approach? Okay, this onomastic approach. Uh, of course, I, I, I do understand uh, what the kind of thesis that uh, you, are, you have been trying to put forward, but uh, there must be some limitations. So during your research, uh, of course, it's a work in progress, but normally what kind of limitations uh, does a researcher come across when he or she try to uh, implement uh, this type of, uh, uh, you know, the methodology or approach, or domestic approach? Uh, thank you, sir, for the question. It's a very, very, uh, I should say, very important question that uh, uh, me and Dr. Akamla has tried to look into. I just want to come up with the strength first. Okay, uh, the strength of this approach is that, like I said earlier, um, we do not have this, uh, you know, study which is limited to orthography. Orthography is the art of writing words with proper uh, letters, right? And therefore, uh, we Nagas, we do not have follow up this orthographic rule. And therefore, it is advantageous for us, but, since you are asking about the limitations, I should say that every approach has a particular limitation. And for this perspective, onomastic perspective, 
uh, we are confined just uh, trying to interpret the names and the events that is surrounding them. However, this is not the wholesome approach because we have to take into consideration uh, literary, uh, I, I should say, works that are existing and then very importantly, archaeological works, which you know can corroborate or bring out, at least verify the truth of uh, this particular uh, approach. And secondly, uh, sometimes uh, this onomastic approach might come to uh, you know a dead end also. I'll just give you one example. There is a particular name that uh, we are trying to look into and then um, this name is actually like claimed by two villages and these villages are very nearby and one happened to be ours and other happened to be another village which I will not uh, mention now but then there is a name called Moya Tongbang and then according to uh, the Aos, Moya Tongbang, the translation is uh, like, you know, there was a time when there was warfare, conflict uh, between some Ao villages and some Sumi villages and because the this particular village was uh, held by uh, one of our people, the Narukam or honorific name was taken, which says that the you know they won over the Sumi in a uh, battle. But it is contested, and therefore we are also trying to look into it whether it is feasible. Now uh, we are lost in translation uh, because of that, so we cannot now accurately identify whether it belongs to this village, that particular village. So these are some of the you know. I should say limitations that will definitely happen. Thank you, thank you, sir. Is there any other question uh, from the participants? Uh, this topic is very interesting. Uh, I believe that uh, many more questions might come. Uh, we we have actually bribed most of them okay <laughs> because this is a work in progress so, yes. yeah of course of course i i i got your points but this is very interesting yeah. i mean you know a historian like you coming here on our platform and uh, sharing uh, his own research work i think that this is our privilege sir and we are very thankful to you uh, okay uh, uh, let me ask you one more question uh, I, I don't know, maybe this question will have any validity or not. But uh, let us use this onomastic approach uh, in, uh, in comparative uh, linguistic studies. Like, for example, mm -hmm. if I want to uh, make a comparison, okay, I mean, I want to learn about the history from comparing the names. Like, I take one name from our community and uh, I take another name from Lotha or or maybe some other community. Okay, mm. so what do you think uh, when it comes to the comparative analysis, comparative linguistic analysis, will this approach work? Uh, uh, will this approach help us to penetrate inside the deeply lit chambers of the hidden history? What do you think of it? Uh, thank you, sir. Actually, I should say that your question is the answer because uh, this monomastic study is more or less uh, confined towards these linguistics. Of course, we have, uh, you know, cases where uh, phonetics is also involved, but then linguistic right. study was uh, one very important aspect. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, thanks to our administrator dr oren uh, we were discussing about a particular term uh, it, this term is called umlaut and most of you might be knowing for those who are you know uh, associated with linguistics this is a german term and they are trying to look into how sound changes or vowels are pronounced in a particular way so uh, I, and i also gave an example of how these uh, people uh, scholars were trying to identify variations in you know letter changes in the Middle East and then trying to uh, give a timeline saying that this person existed maybe around this time and not be before this or after this so uh, linguistic 
angle is very much there. Now, these days, what is happening is that it's not, see, for historians like, uh, you know, many historians, uh, it, I think they will also agree with me that history is just, you know, borrowing ideas from all these uh, disciplines because uh, most of the sources that I have referred for, you know, this presentation, I it, it is very surprising to know that most of these are not historians. They are either linguists, they are sociologists, they are anthropologists, and even uh, these archaeologists have come in. So, yeah, thank you so much. Good, good. Yeah, exactly. So this is basically an interdisciplinary approach, and whenever we get into the jungle of interdisciplinary approaches, we learn a lot. That is that is very true. Any other question? Nisha? No one? Uh, Dr. Rime, uh, you want to ask anything in, in the context of Manipur? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So if if there are if there are no question, uh, then uh, shall I conclude uh, this program with the permission of all of you? Uh, anyway, uh, sir, uh, Dr. Tamjin, uh, can you uh, can you just uh, tell us? I mean, mm. since we have a couple of minutes in our hand, can you just tell us that uh, what motivated you actually to take up this uh, research work? What was your motivation? I mean uh what exactly you are trying to find it out and how your finding will be beneficial uh to the faculty of history and of course to all of us uh, what is your vision and what was your motivation okay thank you sir uh, i should say that i i would like to uh even you know respond on behalf of dr lanukamla who is here uh we were discussing on how uh, to look into new perspectives of coming up with uh, analyzing uh, Naga history. Honestly speaking, oral tradition, yes, it is there. But then uh, oral tradition was more to do with, you know, stories and the, uh, that was passed down. But then in these stories, that interpretative part was not so there, means not there. Uh, of course, it is there, but then not so significant. And therefore, we decided that if we look into maybe names, for instance, then let we will, if we look into the interpretation and how these memories can actually uh, bring back lots of other aspects of uh, the social life, the cultural life, and you know the events that was happening around that particular. Uh, juncture, then it will become a very, very important source to enrich uh, oral, means uh, study on this oral history of the Naga. So that was the motivation that we had, sir. And what about your vision? Pardon, sir? What about your region, sir? <laughs> Uh, yes, this story is actually from my region because since I am the one. No, no, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, vision, vision, sir. Vision vision of your research uh the vision i'm asking oh yes yes uh, the vision uh yeah. see to all the uh, you know uh participants here this is a you know a call means uh, to all of you this is an open project that uh, we want to come up with and then when we say open project uh if in the Naga means not only Naga, but then maybe in the Northeast because we have a very rich collection of you know oral traditions. If we from the Northeast start off this onomastic uh, you know collection, we can archive a lot of uh, events and you know names associated with these events, and that becomes a very very important source to actually strengthen oral history. Uh, but sir, one more. So after implementing this approach, we come out with the data, right? But yes. my question is that how are we going to validate uh, that particular data? How are we going to validate the results? I mean, uh, so uh, what, yes, what is our very, very whatever true, the, very the outcome of uh, you know automatic uh, approach? You know, a data will come out definitely. But how are we yes. going to validate that, and how are we going to examine that? Oh, yes, that's a very interesting question. Uh, sir, to be very honest, uh, we are, when we try to 
look into this particular name, Kim Liba, it was not only the narrator that we uh, interviewed. Uh, we have right, interviewed sir. many other people, elders, uh, who has validated that, yes, this happened. And therefore, uh, when I was concluding, I was saying that it is, you know, the time to actually collect these names and then interpret them before uh, maybe our elders pass away and then the meaning of these names will be lost forever. The memory associated with these names will be lost forever. And therefore, yes, uh, the methodology so far is to validate it from maybe uh, existing uh, Person. See, I also shared about the problem on why we could not go ahead with our study on Moya Tongbang because of the fact that it was not claimed by two villages because these two vill villages are trying to validate a different version. Had it been a same version, we could have come up with this story also. So that is how we are trying to validate. But uh, we are also, again, uh, since uh, archaeological sources as such, is uh, very uh, scanty uh, in this perspective. We are also trying to look into other uh, colonial literature, uh, means sources, means records, uh, to corroborate or to validate what actually happened during that particular timeline. So that is how we are trying to maybe come up with a, a chronology of events also based on the names. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. Before I conclude, uh, uh, Rinsit, if you are there, can you share that feedback form? I'm not able to access my email, man, because of net issues. If you, po if possible, Rinsit, can you please share that feed feedback form so that uh, our participants can uh, share their valuable feedback also, and uh, we can share the same feedback to our speaker as well. Rinsit, please, please do it. Uh, Dr. Temjan, uh, thank you so much. I mean, uh, yeah. you personally inspired me, you know. Now my mind is uh, completely into, you know, uh, whatever you have just shared with us, right? I mean, it is, you are basically talk talking about, uh, sir, possibilities. And I love the word possibilities, right? I mean, you are not simply talking about something uh, which is empty or which has a vacuum, but you are basically trying to create a possibility from where we can actually uh, construct the past events. And uh, that I believe uh, would be a great contribution, uh, would be a great service to our Naga society. And not only you know to the Naga society, but to all those societies who unfortunately does not have the written records of their past, you know. Uh, on this juncture, I, I, I just wish to recall what uh, Adolf Hitler once stated in his uh, autobiography, Mein Kampf, he stated that those people who have uh, forgotten the history cannot create history. Those who doesn't know their history cannot create history. So we always talk about great Naga history, rich Naga history. But here on this juncture, at a very serious note, I want to ask you whether have we really tried to look into the past? whether have we really tried to explore the past there are mysteries there are possibilities let us join hands together let us relieve the past let us work together so that past can show the light towards the glorious constructive and positive future with these words i think dr temjin wabang on behalf of uh, Tetsu College. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. We will invite you once again, you and uh, uh, your partner in research, we will invite you once again to enlighten us more. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And Rinsi, please share feedback form. If you are there, I'm not able to access my email. Uh, please, thank you. Uh, I request all of you to kindly access to that uh, feedback form which uh, my friend Rinsit has shared. And please share your constructive feedback. I'm planning to share all the feedbacks with uh, Dr. Temjen, and this will also be helpful in his research also. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if anybody has any question about the research, uh, sir can be personally contacted. He's an HOD of Unity College. 
uh, his email will be shared on request. Sir, can I leave now? <laughs> sure, sure, sir. Okay. Because of your time. Thank you so much, sir. Please, 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 sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will have to fill up this feedback form also. Dr. Aniruddha, do I uh, fill this form again? No, 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 not you, sir, not you. Uh, I will collect the feedback okay, from the participants and okay. uh, I, will, I will share it with you after some time. Thank you, thank you and so Dr. much. Rimi, and Dr. Rimi is saluting your pioneering work. Let me just read it out the comments which, uh, which are coming up. Let me see. Uh, yes, uh, Nisha said it was a great session. It is a very interesting topic and great idea, but a bit complicated for not having knowledge of the respective language. Correct. Then Dr. Yes, Rimi says, Dr. Rimi says, saluting the pioneering work you have done, sir and madam. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. It is a pioneering work, indeed a pioneering work, sir. In whatever way we could contribute and help your work, we would be really glad because uh, your work is going to be very beneficial to our people, to our society. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So with this, I'll take your leave. Uh, have a lovely evening, everyone. Stay you too, safe. sir. Thank you. Thank you sir. Bye. Please take care. Bye, bye, bye. Take care, all of you. Thank you. Thank you.